afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Mediterranean Dialogues panel on uh, rethinking prosperity, going green, managing the energy transition in post-pandemic times. Uh, I'm Marilisa Palumbo. I'm a foreign desk editor at Corriere della Sera, and I will be moderating uh, today's panel uh, with Georg Zachmann of uh, Bruegel, uh, senior fellow at Bruegel, whose work focuses on energy and climate. Um, so, um, the first shutdown um, due to the pandemic, the economic shutdown, uh, has uh, um, prompted a, a drop in global greenhouse emissions, uh, uh, a big drop compared to, to last year. And this has prompted some uh, more radical thinkers uh, or <laughs> revolutionaries to, uh, to underline or say that maybe uh, the only way to really tackle climate change and climate issues is the degrowth, deglobalization, uh, travel less, uh, uh, change our, uh, our way of life. On the other hand, um, most of the politicians, the pragmatists and reformists say that uh, it is true that the green economy can be the driving engine of the a new recovery, a new uh, global economy that has green economy at its heart. Uh, and the green transition is particularly important for, uh, for the MENA region, uh, because the MENA region uh, is host to some of the most polluted cities in the world, and it's the region that will be affected the most by extremely hot uh, temperatures. Uh, also, it, it's the region that has always, always been at the center of the energy market uh, because of its fossil fuels uh, uh, reserve, but it's also uh, increasingly uh, adopting renewable energies. So uh, we will um, address all these issues today with a, a very rich panel of distinguished guests, politicians, uh, uh, businessmen, investors, uh, uh, so thanks to everyone. I'll ask everyone to um, answer the first question in about five or seven minutes so we can uh, discuss among, uh, among us uh, later. The um, first guest that I'm really happy to welcome uh, is uh, European Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson. Um, welcome. So the, the Green New Deal has really been uh, uh, the poster initiative uh, of Ursula von der Leyen Commission, uh, the, the most important uh, way that she has uh, chosen to, to present herself and her commission to, to the European citizens. So how, uh, what are the priorities of this Green New Deal? How they have changed uh, because of the pandemic? And also if you are, I must ask if you are relieved that um, that in a little more than a month, we will have uh, an American uh, administration uh, that no longer denies climate change, but has uh, uh, even appointed a, a climate czar, which is a renewed public, uh, international public figure uh, like John Kerry. Um, so how, it is, how important it is to have an international cooperation on these issues. Thank you for the good questions and, uh, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, actually, um, just tomorrow, uh, the European Commission will, uh, will celebrate the first year in, our, in office. And as you know, um, during this year, we have launched several very important strategies. In September, the Commission set out a plan for reaching a reduction of 55% greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2030. So this is our short-term target, base target. Um, but this is a very necessary step to uh, lead us to carbon neutral Europe by 2050. So um, that is just nine months after we made this historic commitment to the climate neutral Europe by 2050. And uh, now we can say that um, with the COVID crisis, the economic dimension of the European Green Deal has become even more relevant um, because it is clear that um, our green priorities and our economic recovery should be addressed together. So we cannot afford not to. 
and to support our climate and the energy policy goals. Um, now, Europe also has an uh, unprecedented financial firepower because the uh, European Commission, Parliament, and the leaders of the EU member states agreed in July on a recovery and um, budgetary package to respond to this, uh, this year's crisis. And um, the EU multiannual financial framework, um, this is our long-term budget. And the next generation EU, this is our recovery budget, will lead us out of the crisis in the present. And uh, they will also pave the way for a more sustainable future, um, all in one. Um, we have this kind of um, agreement that uh, the new MFF has a 30% of climate mainstreaming target built in. And that um, ambition is matched in the recovery package, where 37% of uh, each individual na national recovery and resilience plan will be spent on climate-related investments. So extraordinary uh, circumstances. And, um, and we know that um, beyond the financing, this road to 2050 will be a long one. And, uh, and um, to uh, advance our agenda forward, so there are things that we have to do. So as I mentioned earlier, we have adopted a series of strategies, strategy for uh, energy system integration and hydrogen and action plan for a renovation wave in Europe. And, uh, and only two weeks ago, a strategy for offshore renewable energy. But of course, uh, our international partnerships are very important too. Um, uh, but at, at first, uh, we want to lead by example, and all each of these strategies, but they do have something clear in common. Um, so the message is clear that we need to scale up the share of renewables. And we know that right now, uh, here in the European Union, the electricity share is 32% um, of our energy consumption, but it has to, um, to be scaled up to 65% by 2030. So to meet this target, um, we need to deploy new renewable generation capacity, particularly solar PVs, um, but also repowering our existing onshore wind farms and exploiting offshore energy. And if we look specifically at the EU strategy for hydrogen, then um, uh, then this was accompanied by the launch of the Clean Hydrogen Alliance. And, uh, and our approach is, aim is to well, ramp up both demand and uh, production so that we can um, create a well-functioning uh, hydrogen market. And, and of course, our um, long-term focus is renewable hydrogen, um, produced mainly wind and solar uh, energy, um, because it is, uh, it helps us to achieve our long-term goals. But uh, this doesn't mean that this uh, renewable hydrogen must be produced only in our own territories. So there is a very important part also for um, um, partnerships. Partnership is our closest neighbors. Uh, but uh, just this morning, I had a very good meeting with uh, Minister from Chile. And well, even um, like-minded countries uh, far away, uh, to see a opportunity in clean hydrogen. And, and of course, uh, renewable hydrogen offers a unique pathway, such as uh, sectors where it is uh, difficult to cut emissions. So, um, so um, scale it up, we have long-term long uh, targets um, for 2030, but also short-term targets for 2024. And we no now we know that with uh, offshore renewable energy, we also have um, ambitious objectives for the, for the um, uh, renewable electricity. So if we will scale up offshore wind capacity and uh, ocean energy, then, uh, then it helps us uh, also in the way how we can um, secure the um, en necessary energy demand when we will uh, phase out coal and lignite and other um, polluting fossil fuels. So as I mentioned already, all of our strategies, they do have an important external dimension, and uh, they look at cooperation opportunities with the um, southern neighborhood, in particular North Africa. Uh, it is identified as a potential uh, partner for um, offshore renewables and supplier of clean hydrogen to Europe. And, uh, and um, in this regard, um, 
thanks to the dramatic fall in solar and wind technology costs, um, North African countries are increasingly able to generate high levels of cheap renewable electricity, and there is huge potential to develop um, power to gas technology and produce green hydrogen uh, for local consumption and possibly for export. And, and as you know, Europe is a prospective importer of these forms of carbon neutral energy. And, and we are very interested in deepening the cooperation with the countries in the Mediterranean region who share the potential and uh, the commitment to transform and develop the green industry. So we have a lot to learn from one another. And, uh, and um, well, uh, for these reason, reasons, we are currently also working uh, on the development of a green energy initiative that will uh, promote comprehensive support from the EU and its member states to the development of sustainable energy systems um, in African countries. And it will address investment barriers through dialogue with public and private stakeholders. Um, of course, we can't achieve our, our global targets alone. We need like-minded uh, governments. Um, so far, we have uh, had a very good energy dialogue with the United States. So, um, so um, I have no doubt that this um, good uh, cooperation that was established all, already during uh, my predecessor's uh, time in the office uh, will uh, will uh, follow, and uh, and um, and uh, these kind of um, um, energy dialogues with uh, most important partners um, help us to promote our our targets and um, help us to find the like-minded countries. Um, yeah, many thanks, uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, for showing us how active the uh, EU is in the region and uh, intends to, uh, to become even more active. Uh, my name is Georg Zachmann from, from Bruegel, as Marie-Lisa uh, said, and I'm very happy to co-chair the meeting uh, um, and a discussion on a region that either might become a subject to a brutal transition or become an actor that reaps new opportunities that this transition offers. Because the transition will have a double phase for the, for the region. On the one hand, demand patterns will dramatically change. So we will see increase in um, uh, cooling demand. We will see declining oil demand in, uh, in the north and uh, potentially also uh, declining gas demand. But we will also see new technologies emerge that might have a significant potential in the region, like photovoltaics and, and hydrogen and, uh, and wind power, for example, that already made some, some initial steps. But this transformation is gaining in speed. So we are only at the beginning. That's at least what I, we are thinking. And the entire trade patterns in the region, uh, energy trade patterns that have been the most important trade patterns in the region in the, in the past decades, are set to change. So we might not trade any more uh, gas from the south to the north. Uh, we might trade electricity or we might trade hydrogen or we might trade green steel. So here is an extremely exciting region that we want to look into today. And uh, it is my pleasure to, uh, to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Francesco della Camera. Uh, he is Director General at ARENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency. And ARENA is one of the main driving forces to promote the transition towards the use of renewable energy on a global scale. So they are not just looking into the Mediterranean. And I would like to ask him, as he is working at, a, at the multilateral uh, institution, whether he see any benefit in, in multilateral approaches to engineer a green recovery in the region. Francesco? Thank you. Thank you, George. And uh, thank you also, Marilisa. Thanks for your question. And uh, be uh, leading the one multilateral intergovernmental organization as ARENA, that's uh, my reaction is immediately that we believe in multilateralism and uh, also we hope that uh, the new uh, US administration will uh, bring uh, more enthusiasm in, uh, in this way. And uh, allow me uh, to, to, to thank the, the MED organiz organizer, the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation and the Italian uh, uh, Institute for, for Political Study for, uh, for the invitation to be here. It's also a pleasure to, to, to be with, uh, uh, the, to sharing this opening remark with uh, Mrs. Simpson. Uh, I think we are getting used to this, to have a um, virtually meeting and uh, where we have shared 
panel or presentation. So it's always a pleasure to be with her and recognize the, her leadership in the European Commission. Unfortunately, that we meet uh, virtually this year, unlike last year when we were together in Rome. The pandemic brought our lives and economies to a greening halt. It also allowed the centrality of uh, energy in our daily lives. As government take decision on recovery measures, there is a pressing need to prioritize the energy transition and invest in technologies and assets that are fit for the 21st century. The energy system of the future will be based on renewables, complemented by green hydrogen and modern bioenergy. And this is a time like this that we, are, that we need to look to the future a building blocks that provide stability and progress in the pathway to the carbon neutrality. We must look back to see what has worked and what and where the needs are and the base our choices on the coherence and contribution to this future perspective. And what we have seen during the crisis is that renewable based systems show remarkable, remarkable resilience, demonstrating the foundation and readiness to be scaled up. Renewables have seen dramatic cost reduction in the past decades. New solar and wind projects are undercutting the cheapest and least sustainable existing coal-fired power plants. Annual capacity additions from renewables are regularly outpaced those from conventional fuels. In 2019 alone, renewable generation capacity increased by 176 gigawatts, accounting for 72% of new capacity addition that year. While the majority of this was solar and wind, other sources of renewables are also increasing, including biomass, hydropower, and geothermal. MENA region has made significant strides in taking advantage of these failing costs. MENA was one of the fastest growing regions in renewable energy capacity addition in 2019, witnessing a 12.6% growth. The banana solar complex in Egypt or the newer Quasazak uh, contra solar power plant in Morocco are well, very well known. And ARENA, the host country of, uh, uh, the, host country of ARENA, the UAE, has ambitious target strategies. It also leading the Gulf region, adding close to 1.3 gigawatts of solar in 2019. This exemplifies the ambition and the vision of the region. At this moment, we have to address multiple crises. And by investing in energy transition, we can take economic, social, and environmental priorities. Our COVID recovery report adapted our medium and long-term transformation pathway to the current situation and show that investing in energy sector can provide much needed jobs, boost the GDP, and also deliver on our long-term climate objectives to ensure a sustainable tomorrow. We demonstrated that by prioritizing efficiency, renewables and flexible infrastructure, along with innovation, we can make a critical shift to carbon neutral future. But the important point is that such an approach will bring massive social and economic benefits. Let's ask focus on the short and medium term. We need to double energy transition investment up to two trillion US dollar per year in the short term, 2021, 2023, and up to 4.9 trillion per year to 2030. Our analysis showed that each million dollars invested in renewables or energy flexibility will create at least 25 jobs. Each million invested in energy efficiency will create about 10 jobs. This could add 5.5 million for jobs by 2023, 90 million jobs by 2030. Further recovery investment linking to the energy transition would boost the GDP by an additional 1% in the three years period and 1-3% for years to 2030, which is vast renewable energy potential. Accelerating the energy transition can be immensely beneficial for the MENA region. The transition is already underway. Our analysis showed that additional 1.3 million energy transition related jobs will be created in the region by 2030. Both regional and global energy transition is inevitably affecting the conventional energy jobs and value chain. 
It is therefore essential to make this transition just. Renewable energy draws on a wide variety of occupational, occupational groups and the skill set and provide job opportunity for many people. By investing in labor policies and training, we can ensure the creation of a workforce that can meet the needs, uh, the future need as the market evolves. Supporting and leveraging clean energy technologies, including new ones such as hydrogen, as mentioned by the commissioner, would also contribute to energy security and economic self-reliance for oil exporting countries in the region. Arena works indica work indicate that green hydrogen produced from renewable power could become a game changer, complementing electrification and energy efficiency as key pillar in this effort. Importantly, green hydrogen development can open new economic opportunities. The creation of hydrogen economy, including in trade, holds great promise, especially for many oils and gas exporting countries. Arena launched a few days ago the first green hydrogen guide to policy making. Morocco, in cooperation with Germany, is playing a leading role in this regard with the recent announcement of the two Power to X project. We have also seen promising development from Saudi Arabia, where Neum, Neum and Aqua Power recently announced the, the venture to build the largest green hydrogen and green ammonia plant in the world. Probably green hydrogen and this commodity will become competitive before we expect it. On this arena, we'll publish in the next few weeks a new updated report on the cost of hydrogen. Importantly, this is also opportunity for the creation of new and good jobs and industrial development so that the energy transition are not only efficient, but also just. ARENA continues to support our global membership in navigating the way towards energy sector transformation through our diverse empirical and analytical work. Our work in the Mediterranean fall within the framework of the Pan-Arab Clean Energy Initiative and the Southeast Europe Regional Initiative. We work with key partners to enhance local capacities, disseminate best practice, and to improve resource assessment. For example, in June, ARENA launched the Renewable Energy Outlook for Lebanon, which provides recommendations on how the country can achieve its 30% renewable electricity supply target by 2030 in a cost-effective manner. Similar studies are currently under preparation for, for Albania, Jordan, and Tunisia. ARENA also fosters international collaboration and public-private dialogue. For instance, at the request of its members, ARENA established five collaborative frameworks in June, one of which is focused on green hydrogen. And right, the EU and Morocco were elected to co-chair the framework which reflect their leading role in this area. The Climate Investment uh, uh, Platform launched at the UNSG Climate Summit is also a prime example of international cooperation and of multilateralism. ARENA plans to operationalize the platform through sub-regional investment forums by leveraging our strong partnership network within the renewable energy value chain. The COVID crisis has accentuated some of the changing geopolitical dynamics of energy security and independence, as well as a global effort to enhance sustainability and equity. While we witnessed one more time the volatility of the oil market, we also saw the resilience of a renewables-based system at the time of economic downturn. There are some new elements emerging from the current situation. Virtually every country has renewable resource potential. That fundamentally changed global energy dynamics, given that with falling cost of renewable technology, all countries have the potential to harness indigenous renewable energy resources. Many are already benefited from ambition in this regard in using renewable energy to create new alliances and influences. The variable nature, nature of some renewable sources, namely wind and solar, are managed not only through technologies, but also market solutions. Growing the share of renewables therefore promote cross border cooperation which in turn create new co-dependency and political dynamics. Now is the time to get out of the energy silo and promote a holistic approach that consider not only the technology choices, 
but also cross sectorial and geopolitical aspect of the transition. ARENA is working on all these aspects to enable a comprehensive approach to energy that our time in historic demands. Demand. We remain, uh, we remain so, uh, uh, <clears throat> we, oops, we remain so, so keen to work with uh, all of, uh, of you and trying to progress in the way for a clean energy system that the world deserves. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot to Francesco La Camera. And now our next guest is Michele Crisostomo, uh, who is chairman of the Italian energy giant Enel, uh, which operates in more than 30 countries. I think, Michele, that you are from the south of Italy, like I am, if I'm not mistaken. And so we know <laughs> that there is also in Italy a deep potential for um, uh, for to widen also the, the use of renewable energies uh, in uh, in our part of the Mediterranean. Um, so my question is: is how in the last um, 10, 15 years uh, the um, perspective of a, a huge uh, uh, utility giant like Enel has changed, and if the COVID pandemic has even uh, uh, pushed more for uh, for innovation and investment uh, in renewable energies in Italy and abroad. Mm, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, I'm from the south of Italy with a Greek surname, so I'm uh, really, I feel being uh, really at the center of the Mediterranean area. So, <laughs> so thanks for this. Um, so let me start from some numbers. Mm, the first number is that uh, during the last 10 years, we have been seeing a decrease in the cost of the photovoltaic modules by 90, so 90%, coupled with uh, an increase in the efficiency by 31%. Mm. And uh, if you uh, think about it, you can easily understand that the reason why, not only for uh, uh, whatever has to do with the climate change, uh, with uh, the necessity of uh, improving our life quality, and uh, uh, the renewables represent today really the future of the energy generation. And uh, um, at the same time, it explains the reason why uh, there are studies like, uh, you know, some studies published by Goldman Sachs saying that uh, in the next decade, so we have been seeing what happened in the last decade, the next decade, we are going to see uh, investments in the renewable space, which are more than investments in oil and gas. This will happen for the first time. Considering NL, we have already in our generation capacity, uh, shifted from uh, a more carbon focused you know, capacity generation to a more renewable focused generation. So for the first year this year, so 2020, we have been uh, uh, generating electricity from renewable sources uh, more than what we have been doing uh, with the traditional fossil uh, generation plants. So that's, I think those are all elements that I think should be leading us to consider that when we talk about the energy transition, we are talking about something which is ongoing, which is real. It's not something that uh, is something that will be coming if conditions will verify. It's purely a matter of how the speed of the energy transition will be concretely considering all the constraints, mainly administrative constraints uh, and, uh, um, and legacy constraints of, seeing, you know, of individual nations uh, will be having an impact on uh, the speed of this uh, process, which is inevitable at this point. Also because, you know, if we consider also the, uh, what we have been experiencing as a leader in the world, uh, in the renewable space, uh, what we've been seeing, we can see that, uh, you know, renewables contributes to ensure that uh, there is a long lasting and sustainable economic growth. You can build, uh, which is I think pretty significant, a local competitive advantage and you can improve the energy independence. And off top of this, of course, uh, the energy transition will be creating new jobs and it will be stimulating a new value chain with many socioeconomic impacts. I think an element which is pretty relevant is that uh, um, uh, the renewables have a decentralized nature. So we come from a world where we have uh, oil and gas production, which is uh, concentrated in few countries to a space where 
as it has been said also by uh, by Mr. La Camera, you know, a few minutes ago, we have a lot, most part of countries or even all countries may have a, a source of a renewable energy, which I think is another key factor of the reason why from this transition, we will see a drastic change also in the geopolitical, you know, uh, um, balance between countries. And the de decentralized nature of any renewable project will allow small projects that can be implemented associated with the needs of small communities, which will be implying other you know, potential developments. First of all, the development of grids, of networks. We have to put all the potential sources of energy in a network so that the energy can flow from the source to where the energy is to be used, but on the assumptions that you can have the energy generation close to the place where the energy needs to be used. And this has to do with the independence, as I said, of the communities, with the fact that communities can think of a sustainable development of the local economic environment in a way that has been unknown so far. And in all of this, uh, if we have to consider what we are doing as an L, an L is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, has been uh, today producing uh, already uh, generating energy from renewable sources more than uh, what we are doing uh, uh, with the uh, fossil sources. We have a target of decarbonization that we have anticipated by two years respect to the 2030 objectives that was already challenging, but we are committing to do better than what has been envisaged until few, uh, until you know, the last business plan. We have been announcing uh, uh, our new business plan also with a 10 years vision for the first time uh, a few days ago. And uh, out of this uh, business plan, you can see that we are planning to uh, more than doubling, you know, we will be increasing our uh, a renewable generation capacity by 2.7 times what we have now, uh, moving from the current 45 gigawatt of generation uh, to the target of 120 gigawatt generation. So that's a huge space. And just to give you the sense of how this will be um, uh, in, the, in the context of the more the more general market uh, consider that our expectation is that we will be increasing our market share by a few percentage points. So we think, and that's really a target of uh, remaining as we are the leader in the world of uh, uh, renewable generation, we'll be moving from the current 2.5% of the global market in this space up to something close to 5%, which means that you have a lot of players you know, spread throughout the world. And that has to do with the fact that renewables have in front of them a really big space. Mm. Again, let's work on the constraints. We have the technology. The technology is cost efficient. It has to do with a positive and just transition of communities in a decentralized way. So everybody can benefit of it. Let's work on the constraints. And in this, the European community is doing an excellent job. We have heard that, that the words of the commission that goes really in the right direction. Let's work on it. Uh, thank you, Michel. So it's very good to hear that it's not about the direction anymore, but it's more a question of speed of the transition now. So let's, uh, let's get up to speed. And uh, I would like to, to give the floor to uh, Tarek Hamane now. Uh, he is executive director and head of the uh, development at uh, Mason. And Mason is the Moroccan Agency for Solar Energy, a public-private developer of renewable projects in Morocco. And so we have heard a lot about the great potential that uh, uh, countries also on the southern side of the Mediterranean have. Um, and so, so what, what are the policies that are needed to essentially overcome the, the barriers that, uh, that Michaela spoke about? So what policies will your country implement to achieve the renewables targets and uh, what barriers are still left? Tarek? Thank you very much, George. I hope that you you are hearing me well. Uh, first of all, I want to start by uh, saying thank you to the MED organization and the Italian Institute for the Innovation for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm not Italian, but I used to 
to live in Italy, in the south of Italy, for for two years. So uh, from which I, uh, I had a great um, uh, experience there. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, maybe um, just a few uh, uh, points regarding what we did in Morocco. As you know, uh, Morocco has started its path for the decarbonization of energy uh, uh, from ele almost 11 years ago, uh, starting with a clear strategy uh, that placed renewable energy in the uh, heart of the uh, uh, electrical mix with a clear targets, uh, 52%. Uh, minimum of 50% by, uh, by 2030 as a um, clear objective for the electrical mix. By today, uh, we already reached 36% of our installed capacity for renewables, including hydro, solar, uh, and wind. Uh, more than 15 PPA are, are running now in, in Morocco uh, in, uh, in the renewable area uh, with the different. Uh, different developers uh, with work for uh, with different developers all over the world. And uh, of course, uh, one of the most uh, interesting achievement is uh, we, we had uh, here in Morocco, the largest solar complex in, in Warzazet, multi-technological uh, with, uh, with uh, interesting and large uh, facility for storage, of course, in the wind field also. So, uh, uh, and uh, if we do uh, uh, to consider only the projects that are under construction or under financial close today, almost 4,700 megawatts will be added into the grid by the next two, two three years, which uh, allow us by 2023 to reach the 52% of our installed capacity, which means that in fact, we will, uh, reach our target of 2030 earlier in the, we hope, within the next three, three years. And this represents, in terms of the investment we, uh, we did in this uh, field from 2009 right now, more than 10 uh, billion US dollars that has been inv invested in the uh, renewable power uh, sector in, uh, in Morocco. Further that, uh, uh, if we consider the project uh, and the master plan of the power sector between 2023 and 2030, all the project that will be added in the grid will be renewables and storage. Uh, and this will represent almost 10 uh, additional giga of renewables project, uh, which will allow us to uh, to, um, to deal with the, the intermittency also, uh, we'll add something like 3,000 megawatt of storage, including hydrolink and uh, thermal storage. And also uh, in order to avoid the intermittency uh, by this large uh, introduction of renewables, we are developing uh, interconnections. Uh, the advantage of Morocco also here is that we are interconnected with, uh, with Europe existing lines with Spain. We are studying uh, a third line with Spain, another line with Portugal. Of course, we are inter interconnected with, uh, with Algeria uh, and also another, another project uh, which is under development to be interconnected with Mauritania and to play really a, a role of uh, energy hub in, uh, in, in Morocco. So uh, basically, uh, our strategy here is based on enhancing the percentage of renewables in the, in the grid, developing storage, uh, also and interconnections in order to match with our targets and to go the most further we can uh, in this uh, decarbonization of the electrical mix. Uh, of course, we we are blessed in Morocco by having a great uh, potential and great resources in terms of wind and solar that allow us to develop such projects within interesting costs. Uh, we, we get one of the most interesting uh, tariff in terms of wind in, and solar in the world for, uh, for the previous project. 
So uh, basically, the strategy is based on a clear target uh, in terms of uh, renewables uh, all, and also a clear framework that allow uh, the uh, developers and the uh, to, 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 to play the role accompanying this uh, massive transformation and decarbonization of the uh, electric grid. Uh, we have also uh, developed a, a law dedicated to the, uh, to the uh, private sector, called 1309, that allow private sector to invest directly and sell electricity to the uh, uh, end user. We start by we start by opening this law to the uh, uh, big industries, high voltage uh, customers, and by today more than 600 megawatt under are under development for uh, under operation uh, yeah, within this uh, this law, and uh, almost 40 percent of the next uh, project uh, and the project will be developed in the future will be done under this framework, which will be also opened to the medium voltage clients and maybe uh, in the uh, later to the uh, low voltage also. Another point which is interesting to mention here is uh, after this, uh, let's say, first uh, phase, uh, last uh, uh, 11 years, where we reach our targets in terms of uh, uh, renewables uh, in the power sector. We are now reviewing the strategy, the energy strategy to go further than the power sector to cover the whole energy consumption and uh, to enhance our uh, decarbonization targets to cover all the energy consumption. And we, we, we uh, this, uh, this work is under, uh, under progress now. And we start with the introduction of hydrogen so uh, Morocco is uh, preparing uh, a roadmap for the hydrogen. Uh, we and for that we are uh, Mazen is acting also. We, as was men mentioned by Mr. La Camera, we uh, we already announced and launched uh, a first project here in Morocco in uh, in Morocco by by Mazen. Uh, we call it a, a reference project. It's an industrial scale uh, project for uh, green hydrogen. The, uh, the idea is here to dismantle the interest of and the e economic interest of developing uh, an integrated green hydrogen project in, uh, in, in Morocco, including power generation from wind and solar and uh, uh, an accelerator uh, factory. So for this project, we, we already signed some agreement with the German government in order to support the financing of this project. We are targeting something like 100 megawatt of electrolyzer as a first project to, to be developed uh, by 2024. So uh, here also we, we, uh, we are going to uh, the new strategy, which is under, under preparation will define the targets for 2000, to, uh, will update the target for 2030, and will also define target for uh, uh, 2040 in terms of electrical mix, but also in terms of uh, all energy mix, uh, taking into consideration the old uh, news here, like hydrogen also, the introduction of uh, uh, battery storage and other, uh, a new solution. Uh, murder four. Uh, we are also uh, Mazen and Morocco working on the uh, Mediterranean integration in terms of uh, renewables. We have the, as I mentioned before, the the advantage of being connected, interconnected with Europe and with the uh, MENA region to Algeria, and we initiate uh, uh, an initiative called Set Roadmap in order to develop the exchange of energy between the two rivers of uh, Mediterranean and to create uh, by, a, uh, we hope, a short time, a real market of exchanging uh, green electricity uh, between the countries. So this agreement has been signed uh, between Morocco, uh, Spain, uh, Portugal, France, and Germany with the support of the uh, European Union. 
so we hope we, we will start by developing uh, uh, green corporate PPA that will allow and will enhance the uh, development of rubber project and integrate, uh, create a, new, a real integrated mar market between the uh, two ribs of uh, Mediterranean. So this is just a, a few updates of uh, uh, what we are doing here in Morocco and Mazen will be available if there is any addition. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq Amane. That's uh, quite a lot going on there. <laughs> so um, we stay in Morocco to talk uh, with Obaid Amrane, Chief Executive Officer of Itmar Capital, uh, which is a Moroccan sovereign wealth fund. Uh, I'd like to ask you, Obaid, um, which are the investment priorities uh, in, uh, in the MENA region? And also, what are the uh, also the reforms uh, that are needed uh, to to catalyze energy investment in the area? Well, first of all, thank you. I want to say thank you. I'm very happy and uh, honored to participate in this uh, important panel and uh, to hear my uh, co-speakers' insightful words. Uh, I would like. Uh, to say thank you to the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and to the International Corporation and to the Italian Institute for International Political Studies for the great event. Um, I didn't get the opportunity to live in South uh, uh, Italy, but I, uh, I, I do have the opportunity to appreciate either the North and the South of Italy. So. Uh, so just to begin with these words, um, just to come perhaps with uh, what has concluded the uh, Tariq uh, with speaking uh, about the set roadmap. Uh, and this is one of the illustration of the leadership that uh, Morocco has uh, uh, driving in the region uh, to See how we can uh, how in how cooperation and collaboration are important in, in 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 this field, and how much we need it. Furthermore, and uh, all what has been done and said uh, for me keep not uh, still not enough to go at the level of the expectation and at the level of the possibilities that are offered by uh, the renewable energy and by the opportunities it can create. The, the, the question here, when we are talking about collaboration and uh, partnership, is to say what want we ask to make the Mediterranean region in the future? This is one of the first questions we have to solve. We see how much uh, uh, question regarding uh, security, immigration, uh, are becoming more and more accurate and will be, will be so hard in the future, also uh, because of the climate change. So that's why uh, we, we take this opportunity to, and we take the, the leadership to say we should find the way to create the momentum around renewable energy and all the, the decarbonization aspect. But unfortunately, whatever uh, it is important, it takes time, it takes a lot of time. And uh, we should, I think, uh, take the opportunity of this pandemic uh, to give us a new way of working around that. If you, take, if you take this initiative where all the, all the countries uh, were very um, uh, willing, willing to, to advance with the, 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 this, this aspect, it takes four years to get to an, to an agreement to create the possibility of uh, making some PPAs, uh, corporate PPAs between European between South uh, Mediterranean and in the North of uh, Mediterranean. Uh, energy aspects are, uh, are, are not the easiest one to be handled when it comes to European affairs. 
So it is not easy. Uh, it takes a lot of time, and uh, the needs are uh, and the opportunities are uh, are going fast. And we should give an answer to that. Coming back to the first question, which was, what could we do to because all of the countries today take the pandemia as a, and take the renewable energy and the decarbonization as a fuel to the growth, to the to the to 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 going out from the the recession. We should have and we can have projects that can that that can share the wealth either between the north and the south of the Mediterranean region. Today, when you analyze the needs of uh, European countries and the need for the industrial decarbonization uh, of uh, the industrial, uh, of the European industrial uh, uh, capacities, you will find that the needs for uh, the, this decarbonization will be typically done with renewable electricity. And the amounts are very huge, are very big. So we do need uh, to, to foster uh, a real collaboration constructed uh, on a new set of making a uh, new collaboration uh, that goes beyond uh, exchange of uh, knowledge, uh, creating the framework, but creating the opportunity of co-investment to go in further in this in this matter. I'm very happy that in this uh, that in this uh, panel we have with us industry and the and the the change will come from there. So we do need uh, to have support from uh, from policies from politicians but also a willingness from industrial developers uh, to create, as I, as I was uh, saying, uh, the way to generate uh, wealth from uh, this new opportunity that is being today on our uh, hands when it, comes to, when it comes to define how we want to live and how, wh wh which planet we want to leave to our, to our descendants. So I believe uh, that, those, uh, th that those aspects are not just ideas or uh, hypothetical schemes, but can be delivered in industrial projects where, uh, where the, where the, where the, where we are in a situation of a win-win, uh, a win-win concept uh, that can uh, that can give to the European region a much more stability, much more uh, creation opportunity from the both sides for the long run to the benefit of the to the benefits of their uh, citizens. So those were my my comments. A lot of things has been said by by Tarek. You ask me what could be uh, what could be the opportunities for investment. I tell you that all things that are related to decarbonization can be shared around the Mediterranean region, not concerning the energy or the electricity of the molecule, but also the green feedstock that can be used. In, this, in, in, in different value added schemes or chains uh, that you can find for industry. And this can also contribute to the strategic stability of the region regarding the, 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 the world value chain from, the, from, the, from Asia to to Mediterranean and to make things that are more close to consumer and to producer. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Obaid. That is a perfect transition for for a question that uh, that I have in the back of my mind, because uh, you allude to the to the very different ways in which uh, green energy can be uh, can be essentially an opportunity. 
And I'm asking myself, yes, there are so many futures, different futures possible, but on which one should we bet? And um, what will be the economic opportunities for different parts of the uh, of the Mediterranean? So, so my question would be to uh, to Francesco La, La Camera, essentially. Um, we might see a world in which North Africa continues to export a lot of gas. We might see a world where it becomes an uh, electricity exporter. We might see a world where it becomes a hydrogen exporter to the European Union. Or we might see a world we, uh, where, as you say, essentially the, the molecules are transformed into, into products like green steel or green chemi uh, chemicals or other products. So what will be the, the big kind of value movement in the future. Will North Africa manage to move up the value chain from electricity to hydrogen and even to, to products to export? Or will North Africa continue to, uh, to stay essentially the exporter of the, of the uh, energy only? Um, uh, Francesco, um, would you have a view on, uh, on that? You know, the, the fact is that uh, uh, there is no real uh, choice between the two options. Because if you want to be in, uh, in, in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement, be in line with the 1.5 pathway, it means that uh, coal and oil has already picked and gas has to pick by 2025. So this is where we have to put the answer to your question. So uh, I think that uh, uh, all the MENA region has a tremendous potential for going as Morocco is showing is possible and is leading under respect to go for exporting green hydrogen. And this is also an interesting matching between different interests because as uh, the Commissioner Simpson say, EU has to import energy sources and they want to, to import clean energy sources. So this to respond to this demand. In the same time, the exporting country may build an industrial capacity that will change the partner of the old way relationship between the North and the South, where the relation between these two different worlds could be more equitable and just. If I have to talk and I, and, and I close with this, just about the region we are, I'm best, they can export green hydrogen at a, a value. This is the same of the oil and gas export today. So this is the way to go. So I think that uh, if we all as well we want to stay in the limits, in the goal of the Paris Agreement, the sustainable developments. The answer is very clear. So we have to go for, and as I said at the beginning of my intervention, the energy future, of the, the energy system of the future is renewables, complemented by green hydrogen and modern bioenergy. We have no other way. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, Michele Crisostomo, back to Michele Crisostomo. Um, you, you were planning to um, bring energy from, uh, from, from Africa to, to Europe, to European countries, uh, or uh, produce it mainly for, for, uh, for domestic consumption. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, uh, Enel published um, a report on uh, on cities, uh, on uh, sustainability in the cities. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the MENA region is home to some of the most polluted cities in the world. So, um, yeah, I'd like to ask if you are planning to uh, to do something there to 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 invest on uh, depollution uh, and so in the cities, also in the MENA region. Thanks. Mm. No, thank you for these two questions, which are very interesting. On the first one, it is extremely difficult today, while I can see what Mr. La Camera has just said in terms of what our future will be on, uh, again, hydrogen, uh, you know, renewable sources. And uh, uh, it is difficult to say the way the renewable plants will be located. 
And this has to do with the choice that uh, is allowed by renewable sources, which is what I said uh, earlier on the decentralization of the sources. So we are not bound by a specific site, but we can have the choice today on the way we would like the electricity generation to be developed in terms of we want a mega electrolyzer coupled with a mega photovoltaic or wind plants, or we want to have smaller electrolyzer producing hydrogen so that we can have the storage associated with the, the needs of, the, of a specific community and therefore associated with the local renewable sources plants. This I think is a choice that we have today. So it's a matter of us going in one direction or in another. If you ask me personally what I think, I'm more inclined to believe that the energy transition should be freeing us up from local constraints in terms of uh, we have the opportunity through a big investment plan with the investments that are affordable from an economic perspective to have the energy generation really linked to the place where the energy should be used. And in this connection, we go, I think there is a big link also with your second question, which is uh, if we think about the city of the future, the city of the future has to do with electricity. Electricity in the context of a smart grids, in the context of grids that will allow digitalization is really what will be making our cities more sustainable from an environmental point of view and therefore also from a social point of view, which means that we should be thinking in the sort of integrated process of considering how cities will be de developed to have uh, all the chain considered in the context of a specific uh, city, starting from the generation of electricity to the way electricity is, uh, uh, will be uh, used in the context of the city and what electricity should, should be firstly be aimed at, allowing a city to be digital, which means that we will have a better environment for people, a better environment for uh, businesses. In this connection, I think that, uh, again, as we have the choice today on the way we would like uh, the future to be designed, we have uh, the investments, we have regulators that are looking into that. Uh, let's make the right choice. I think this is where we really need to focus. I, I'm not sure that you know, we are going in either, you know, in, a, in one of the directions that I mentioned, but definitely we have the opportunity to make the right choice. So let's really think about it. So maybe I, I would have a question to uh, Obaid in, uh, as a, as a follow-up to, uh, uh, to, uh, to what we just discussed. I mean, the, the EU bets massively on imports of clean electricity and clean hydrogen. My country, Germany, is, uh, is having a strategy that, uh, that foresees importing huge amounts of hydrogen to, uh, uh, in order to uh, meet our energy needs and uh, especially also that of, uh, of uh, the German industry, including the steel industry, which is potentially one of the uh, hydrogen consumers of the, of the future. Now, um, the question that I'm turning in my head, and you, you, you heard that in my earlier questions, is a bit, will it be acceptable for Morocco to essentially be the location where all this hydrogen is being produced? So a lot of locations with solar panels and electrolyzers and hydrogen shipping ports, however they are being organized, uh, to then bring this valuable hydrogen to make the, the big value in Germany in terms of steel plants and, uh, and their uh, very, very value added is being pro, uh, produced. Or would you essentially say, well, actually the, the long shot but, uh, but real goal will be to, to produce the steel in Morocco uh, at some stage and to, uh, and to keep the, the hydrogen and essentially keep the sun in Morocco. Um, so, so what, what's the uh, what's the uh, what's the strategy there? Thank you for this question. I I, I really believe that there is uh, no one answer to to, to this to this question. Uh, 
because I, I, I believe that uh, uh, those aspects are resolved by the, by the economic equation. If there is a benefit that we share hydrogen from Morocco, I think that it will be done. Morocco is an open economy, accepts foreign investment, incentivize them, uh, respect its uh, commitments, and it's a very uh, good destination for investment in general. Uh, if there is an opportunity to integrate more value added uh, into some value chain, uh, if economies and if willingness is there, it will be done. And we have already demonstrated in Morocco that some industrial activity are very well run here and uh, there is no uh, problem for, for the others. So there is not only the issue of, uh, of steel, you can find all the, as I said, uh, all that what integrated a high level of electricity consumption with the, with, with, and you, if you, 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 if you, you accumulated also the fact that the, gre the green pattern of the, of, of the, of the molecule of the, or of the, uh, the, the feedstock you can go far beyond the energy, you can go either far beyond the electricity. So this is the future. And uh, those aspects are not uh, very simple. They need uh, to be studied for long term and have uh, major impact. Uh, if you only take uh, the illustration of what Tarek has said uh, regarding the set roadmap, uh, which is the sustainable electricity trade. Uh, the, a study that has been conducted in the framework of this uh, uh, of this uh, of this uh, negotiation has demonstrated, and all the countries have accepted those results, that the fact of improving the interconnection and improving the production makes. Uh, value creation for all the four countries regarding aspects of uh, even uh, with large amount of production in countries like uh, like like Morocco. It, it improves the system in general. So uh, so those those aspects I, I those those subjects I, I believe in them because if you and perhaps. La camera, Mr. La camera can give us more insight uh, regarding that. The, 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 the estimation of the need of new electricity capacity for decarbonization for 2050 in Europe are very huge and are counted in, in, in tens of thousands of terawatts. All this electricity uh, will we, we need to be. Uh, either pro produce it, as 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 uh, as uh, as uh, Mitchell has said, we need to make the good choice, and the good choice are not changing the world dramatically. Things will be uh, constructed progressively, and in this in those progressions, we should have the good path, and we should have the right decision that are, that are not constrained by uh, short-term agendas. Which, that, this is very important for me, and this is what makes long-term projects very risky, better to use, and create work for everybody. So the decarbonization can definitively be a good fuel for growth in the Mediterranean region, and we should see how we can improve all the opportunities and how we can handle all the opportunities that can be available for us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I would like to go back to Tarek Amane and um, to ask him 
I mean, Morocco's uh, primacy in renewable energies, uh, you mentioned some uh, specific collaboration with uh, some European countries. Uh, so first question is if you think there are more opportunities uh, in general with the European Union, but also if you think that Morocco's example can be uh, important for, uh, for the region, for other countries around that are not as stable as Morocco, and uh, yeah, and can give a path and or a model for them. Thank you very much for the uh, question. Uh, maybe before to answer to the question, I, will, I want just to come back to the uh, question of uh, George and uh, complete uh, what has been said by, uh, by Rubaid. Uh, in fact, it's an economical question. If there is an interest to produce, or to have a, a local content in Morocco for the whole chain value, it should be done. And it's also related to the quantity. So if we took the example of what has been done in the renewable, uh, in the renewable uh, industry, uh, we start with a few projects, wind and solar, and uh, within the increase of the project to be developed in Morocco, we attract a big player like Siemens to establish a factory in Morocco, which is now producing blades and uh, they're serving the local market, but also exporting. So it's a question of uh, market, of scale, of advantage of manufacturing equipment in Morocco or just uh, consuming or just exporting. So he here there is, I think, a similitude with the with hydrogen, because if we look at to the numbers uh, uh, and number of gigawatt that has to be developed in order to cover the needs of, uh, we, if we took just an example of ammonia, Morocco now is uh, consum consuming something like 2 million ton ammonia a year. If we want to substitute the production of ammonia by uh, green hydrogen, this will request to establish at least six giga of renewable project, mainly dedicated to production of ammonia just for the local need in Morocco. If we take in addition what uh, needs the um, uh, European markets, this will present a dozen of gigawatt of capacity to be installed. So here, I think that because of the scale, because also of the advantage of manufacturing some equipment in, uh, in, in Morocco, uh, thanks to the infrastructure we have, uh, good ports, also well-educated people that can, uh, I mean, uh, works for such factories. I think it's legitimate for Morocco uh, to target that not only the production of the molecule should be uh, done in locally, but also a portion of the uh, chain value, maybe the manufacturing of the uh, electrolyzers or other uh, uh, equipment. So just maybe a, a few a few words about what you you said before, uh, and I think we have the uh, the ambition, but also I think uh, all ingredient in terms of uh, targeting uh, a larger. Uh, uh, integ local integration in, uh, in, in, in this field. Coming back to the um, question um, right into the experience of Morocco, of course, I think uh, Morocco has dismantled for the last decade that it, uh, we, we, uh, we did a good, good job in terms of renewables. Uh, we, uh, we, I mean, the, the what is interesting to, to hear, hear to mention about what we, we did in Morocco as, is what we, we defined clearly our strategy. Uh, we were completely, uh, let's say, uh, we don't follow any model. So we create our own model that feeds our needs, that's match also with our uh, own capabilities. And we establish and we, uh, the all instruments that support the implementation of this strategy in terms of uh, creation of a dedicated body like Mazen, which were created in order to, um, to de deploy and to implement the, the strategy. 
the, the of course, uh, a, a quite clear and um, uh, uh, legal framework allowing us to develop uh, the, the, the project. Also, uh, I think uh, a strong, uh, let's say, uh, uh, business environment with uh, with also the, the the role played by the uh, by the banks, the international uh, financial institution, and also the local banks that are supporting many of our uh, project. I think that here also we can of course. Uh, share this experience with uh, our neighbors. So in that field, uh, Mazen is working closely with different uh, uh, African countries, sharing our experience and also trying to develop uh, together renewable project. Uh, this is what we are doing uh, with, uh, as, as an example, with Zambia, with uh, uh, Nigeria, or with also, uh, we are also acting in Burkina Faso, so different African countries where we are trying to support them in terms of uh, exchanging experience and knowledge, but also uh, developing a common project. So I think that uh, we are also having some discussion with the Tunisian in order to, sh to say what we can do together uh, and Mauritania also, uh, but of course, uh, each of the project, each of these uh, South Mediterranean countries has a great uh, potential in terms of, uh, of solar mainly, some also in terms of wind. It is, uh, uh, of course, a, a work to be done in the legal framework, in the in business environment also, in order to, uh, uh, to support and to make the project bankable. And we are happy also to see that in Tunisia, for example, things are going in a in a in a good way with uh, some projects that are uh, now uh, seeing the light uh, for in the solar field. We hope also that uh, some project in the wind area also will uh, will come here. Uh, to, um, Egypt also with a large program, uh, but of course uh, it's not just a question of target or strategy, but it's mainly a question of implementation and support. So um, many thanks, Tarek. Um, I was quite surprised, I must say, by, by today's event, because it was, a, uh, was an extremely optimistic panel. And in this time, you, you don't have often that optimistic panels, at least in, uh, 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 in Brussels. Uh, that's, uh, that's not very common. So I'm very pleased uh, to, um, and I would like to thank you all for, uh, for your uh, yeah, very forward-looking um, um, approach to uh, to the green energy transition in the Mediterranean region. I think we all agree that uh, that there is huge potential for the green transition, and that there are different roads in the region to green energy transition, which is good because if one road might be blocked, we might take another one. And we we have seen several and identified several of them. Uh, we see that the speed that we can take on the road will depend on the regulation. So it's like on a German street. And uh, so let's hope that the uh, that the regulations are, are forthcoming here, and um, that yeah that we will have essentially we will arrive at the target, and it's only a question of time and uh, and the amount of regulations and the road we take that uh, that will arrive at a decarbonized energy system in the uh, in the wider Mediterranean European Euro Mediterranean region. So I would like to to thank you all for uh, for this really upbeat message that we uh, that we brought together. Um, and uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers of the event, um, the, the speakers, of course, and uh, most of all, the, the audience, because without an audience, uh, there is no good events. So thank you very much and uh, hope to, to see you all soon again. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.